So let me set the scene for, for this conversation. We're talking about the future of science and technology in society. Of course, science and technology are part and parcel of society. They form um, a, a crucial part of everybody's lives. So it is little wonder, therefore, that scientists and technologists are concerned with the image that the society has of themselves and the level of trust that society has in researchers and technology developers. Um, perhaps in this day and age, it's particularly important that we concern ourselves with this because, we, of course, we have all seen um, decision makers um, uh, doubt um, experts and expert opinion and hence our interest in, in, this, in the opinion in the society of, of scientists and, and technologists is even uh, further heightened. Having said that, um, there are some curious um, facts that we know about. We know that members of the general public actually hold scientists um, in um, uh, important regard. General, sci generally, science, scientists as, pro as a profession are well respected. Uh, these are, this information comes from polls mainly uh, conducted in uh, the global north, especially um, in North America. Interestingly, in the same polls, journalists tend to do particularly uh, poorly in terms of the, the general public, uh, public opinion. And yet, at the same time, there is a concern in the society over the role and the influence that uh, technology, particularly digital technology companies, exert um, over uh, the society um, and how that business uh, conducts, how those businesses conduct themselves. Again, allow me to refer to, to some um, relatively recent data from, from North America. So, for example, um, the general public in the US believes that these digital technology companies um, um, have um, particularly um, favor views of, of specific groups. For example, 43% um, of the general public believes that um, those groups, th those uh, technology companies support liberals versus conservatives. 23% uh, believe that these companies favor views of men over women. Um, and very interestingly, and perhaps not surprisingly in recent years, 72% believe that social, me social media platforms actively censor political views. S two other pieces of statistics uh, for you to bear in mind and for the panelists to consider is 75, so, I pardon, 65% uh, percent of Americans agree with the following statement, that the, the technology, digital technology companies often fail to anticipate how their products and services will impact society. And 24% of that same um, uh, population who took the poll um, say that those companies uh, do not do enough to protect personal data um, and their users. Um, and in general, um, few think that technologists are, are trustworthy and 50% of those who express an opinion think that technology companies should be much more strictly regulated. So there's an interesting setting, interesting dichotomy perhaps between how scientists as professionals are considered and what the general public thinks about technology and technology companies. So this is what, what we're here to, to discuss and um, we have a, a, a fantastic panel uh, to discuss it with me so I will introduce them uh, in order. So here on my left immediately we have uh, Carlos, Carlos Moedas. Uh, who's Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation at uh, European Commission, and by training, he's a, a civil engineer. Uh, next to him is uh, Salah, Sarah Almiri, uh, Minister of State for Advanced Sciences for the United Arab Emirates, originally trained as a computer engineer. Um, uh, next, we have uh, Uli Spieshofer, President and CEO of ABB Group. Um, originally an um, economist by training. Uh, next to him is uh, Lars Sorensen, uh, chairman of the board of directors and Novo Nordisk uh, Foundation. Um, originally uh, studied forestry and economics and until recently was president and CEO of Novo Nordisk. And last but most definitely not least, um, we have Brian Schmidt, who's a professor of astronomy and vice, vice chancellor of uh, Australian National University 
a Nobel Prize winner in physics uh, in 2011. So let me open um, with the first, first, first question to, uh, to Sarah. The, the data which I was just referring to and most of the information which we have, of course, comes from North America, but more broadly from the global north. You bring a very interesting perspective to this conversation. What does the situation look like in United Arab Emirates and in the Middle East more broadly? In the Emirates and the Middle East in general, um, the focus when it comes to science and technology hasn't gotten to a point um, from where what we see this, the statistics reflect in terms of a lack of trust maybe in technology companies. Uh, the reason for that is a lot of our economies, including the UAE, is not highly intensive um, on science and technology driven um, organizations. That being the case for us, science and technology is actually the dynamo of the future of our economy especially when a lot of the countries that are oil-based countries are moving and pushing more towards diversifying their economy. We see science technology as the actual foundation for the future of that. And when we're talking about an entire region that is 60% made up of people that are under 35, there is quite a thirst for opportunities and also quite a thirst um, for stability overall. And the drivers towards and the needs for, for the group of people between the age of 20 and 35, which is what our region, not only the UAE, but the region is made up of, is looking more and more towards, um, towards science and technology as a means to an end. So as creating opportunities for them, as creating jobs for them, and creating better stability within their own um, societies. So the perception sort of and the need for science and technology has, is, is quite different from a region that is well stabilized when it comes comes to um, the overall science technology ecosystem. Perceptions, like you said, about scientists, again, it's the same um, as everywhere else in the world. It's quite, it is quite high, and they do hold them in high regard, but there is a large disconnect between the science community and uh, overall society that we see that, that there is still that sort of perception that scientists are a small niche um, in society of a particular IQ that are quite disjoint than everybody else. And that sort of hinders more and more people entering into sciences. But when we see engineering, the region has quite a high concentration of graduates when it comes to engineering. And the utilization of their skills and capabilities falls well aligned with technological um, advancements for the region. So the next drive as in terms of priority for us is having more and more um, companies being established out of the UAE and out of the region that develop technologies and develop so and solutions for societal needs. Thank you. Very interesting um, how being at a different stage, you, you have a greater potential to, to shape that perception, uh, but indeed um, the situation uh, is, is different currently. Yuli, if I can follow up um, with you on this. So in, in the global north, as I described it, um, we do have a, 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 an issue with that perception. What, why do you think that is and what can be done about it to, to, to bring about change? Yeah, when you take today's situation around technology, many people have an issue and say, can I trust it? Do I believe in it? Do I want it? And when you do the root cause of it, Typically, there are a couple of observations. Number one, people are not concerned about the technology. They are concerned about what the technology does. And therefore, we should not decouple a perspective on science or technology from the use of it. We should always look at it jointly. I'll just give you an example. When you get up in the morning as an elderly person and you go in the garage and you see a car, is that good or bad technology? It's great technology because it gives you convenience in getting around. Now, the same technology used with a bad purpose might become a weapon. So I think the value and the solution that you drive from a technology perspective is one thing that we were aware of. Second, we talk a lot about potential negative impacts of technology. We by far don't talk enough about the positive effects of technology. Ask an elderly person, let's stay with that, what AI in a building does when the elderly person can just say, switch on the light, get me some food, fill up the refrigerator by internet shopping, out of the sudden it becomes something very positive and positive received, and we're going to get it going. 
If you look at the history of mankind, the development of prosperity, of growth, of wealth, hangs directly together with technology. Don't forget, in 1990, 30% of the global population lived below the extreme poverty line. Today, it's less than 8%, and we have the ambition to get it to zero. Now, what's the pattern that got us there? Let's first start with the parts of the world that did not embrace technology. Take Africa. Africa has some signals of adoption of technology, but altogether has done much less than other parts. We have today more people below the extreme poverty line than before, which is really concerning and means a call for action for us as leaders in society and industry. Take countries like India and China. The last 20 years, more than 400 million people have been moved from below the extreme poverty line into a higher income bucket, meaning that we have today a much better pattern than that. And the use of that, or the driver of that, was really the application of human force together with technology going forward. We see that everybody in the world today is afraid about robotics, because perceptions are being created that robots kill jobs. And the opposite is true. If you look at the re-emergence of the American automotive industry, it would not have happened if automation <coughs> excuse me, and robotics together wouldn't have allowed world-class productivity and quality of the outcome of the processes that we're going to get going. So there is an information element of the trust that we need to work on. But there's a second element <coughs> that we also need to work on. Because people totally legitimately say, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for my job? And if you look at it in 2030, 10% of global population will work in jobs that don't ex exist today. One third of the American population works today in jobs that didn't exist 25 years ago. So we have a mandate in front of us to take the people with us. And we need to take the people with us in a couple of different dimensions. First, do the information what it means. What is coming your way? What do we do? The second piece <coughs> is we need to take our mandate very, very serious between politics, education, and industry to take the people with us and shape the future of employment. The World Economic Forum has done a study. And the study says automation will kill 75 million jobs. And that's the number that everybody focuses on. But at the same time, the same study says it will create 133 million new jobs in parallel. And that's the transition that, people, that drives anxiety and fear. Because people might say, I might be in the 75 million bucket, and who helps me to get into the 133 million bucket? And that's something, we, as responsible leaders, we need to take up. I give you an example of our own company. In 2005, I joined ABB. We had about 19 billion turnover comparable basis. We had 90,000 people. We had 47,000 blue collar people. Today, we have 36 billion turnover, we have 146,000 people, and we have 42,000 blue collar people. That means we have taken the employment, the staff profile, in a completely different shape. And we have done this in a responsible, proactive way. And that's the mandate that we need to take on. We had recently, we used digital technologies to take a 1.4 billion cost out of our general and admin processes. And at the same time, we said, what do we do with the people? We would have had huge restructuring charges doing that. And we looked at our, elderly, at our age pyramid in the company and realized we need to hire every year between eight and 10,000 people to really safeguard the growth of the company at the same time. So we said, with HR together, we said we take the people and we offer them a redeployment and a re-education. It cost me 35,000 euro to re-educate somebody in Germany, it cost me 100,000 to fire somebody. So it's, it's economically attractive to do the right thing. And it's also, from a staff perspective, hugely motivating to do that. So what we have now embraced, and I stop with that, we have embraced of a, in a journey of continuous change where people know they have to expect <coughs> their job will be changing, 
but we have also embraced on a journey where people know we take care of them. And I think that's the mandate to all of us. We don't have 75 million people or 133 million people. That's a mandate to all of us between politics, education, and industry to take this serious, to take the mandate. And then I'm sure we're going to achieve growth, prosperity, and wealth with a higher level of confidence and trust and a more positive momentum than what we are seeing today. So these comments are particularly interesting to consider in the light of one of the statistics that I gave you at the beginning, and that is 65% of the people in these uh, polls in North America believe <coughs> that these companies that, that we're now talking about fail to anticipate how their products and services will impact society. And so there's a clear mismatch in, in uh, what... Can I just comment on that specific have... one? Because this is a very small set of technology companies. Mm -hmm. This is the Facebooks, Amazons of the world. That's a set of 12 companies that basically drive the perception there. Technology leaders are active in the B2C space. They're active in the B2B space. The main distrust is at the moment happening on the B2B, B2C space on the topics that you mm -hmm. just mentioned, and we need to address it. But we need to calibrate that's it. That's right. So, so that's also quite interesting. Who shapes that perception, which Absolutely. then spreads over the whole uh, the whole sector and the community. Let me turn now with a question to, to Lars. Of course, you have an interesting perspective of having been on the, on the business um, side of things, but most recently you have moved to a foundation. Has that, has that changed your perception now and, and your insight into what we can do in order to, sh to change the, the perceptions that we're talking about here? Yeah, I would say that journey has informed me of my, my current opinion. The Noah Norwich Foundation has as one of its remit to support uh, basic science in primarily in biomedical research, but also increasingly now in natural sciences uh, and through education. And as such, uh, we have a fundamental belief that knowledge uh, creates progress. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, trust is very, very important. And uh, we also believe that without technology, and science, we cannot solve them all the major problems that we are facing right now. So that trust is even more important today than it has ever been. Uh, societies are becoming more plural. In the past, it was the experts uh, that had a voice. Now everybody has a voice. And hence, we can sometimes get blinded by the fact uh, that, that the choir is so diverse and the messages are so diverse. So the internet, the advent of the internet and social media are both part of the problem, but also hopefully part of the solution to regaining or creating the trust that we need. We need simply a credible source uh, of information to proceed. And so my initial perception was that, geez, I was looking at some particular events recently uh, where information at, at social media uh, had informed the public of health decisions uh, which were, were probably not the best for their health based on a misconception uh, of natural treatments and remedies. And I, I know Brian can talk at length to this. In the, even in the face of, I would say, overwhelming scientific evidence uh, to the contrary. And this just goes to show that there is something which is a problem. But then I started to reflect, is that a new thing or, or have I experienced this in the past? And when I look back at my time with the company, uh, I started in, in the industrial biotechnology part and then moved to healthcare. I spent 34 years with the company. The first issue was when we tried to introduce modern biotechnology. Um, this was industrial manufacturing of bioingredients uh, for different household products and industrial processes. And one of them was uh, enzymes for detergents. There was a big public debate about whether this was hazardous for, for the consumer. And a lot of NGOs were very aggressively against uh, this new technology. Uh, and hence, uh, we had to delay off 30% of our staff until 15 years later, we were able to convince the public that this was actually to the contrary, that these uh, perishable biochemicals could help us lower the temperature uh, of the washing process, being ecologically much more sound and completely biodegradable 
in nature. The next experience was the experience of GMOs. The advent of our ability to genetically modify both organisms and plants. In terms of uh, organisms, it was relatively easy to convince the public that GMOs for human health purposes was probably a good idea, as long as the manufacturing process was contained. GMOs for industrial processes were slightly more suspicious in the eyes of the public, uh, because what is the gain? Is the gain outweighing any unquantifiable risk? And certainly, as when it came to plants, this was meaning planting new plants out in society that were altered genetically. The precautionary principle has led to this not being applied at all in Europe, as opposed to the United States, based on the precautionary principle. And in recent <coughs> days, we have seen an uh, issue of vaccine where the public perception has been that, well, maybe there's some, you, you get sick, you get autism, uh, you get other ailments by being vaccinated. So vaccination rates are coming down, measles are becoming an issue. H HPV uh, virus uh, uh, treatment is, is being less than what it should be in the face of scientific overwhelming evidence. So I think that we need to recognize that this has always been an issue, uh, that it is, uh, rather than criticizing the public uh, for not understanding our wonderful science and technology, we need to understand that, that we need to be in interaction uh, with society about our intentions, the risks associated uh, with the technology that we embark on. Uh, we see a very stark recent example of uh, genetic engineering of, of babies to create HIV resistance in China, uh, which has, of course, gone completely over the edge of, in terms of what we would ethically and morally recommend. Uh, and, and this is being highly debated at the moment. So it is upon us, it is upon all of us, uh, to educate uh, the public and go into a dialogue with the public about the benefits, but also recognize that some of the risks, which may be perceived risks, uh, may be emotional concerns, uh, will have to be dealt with. And unless we deal with them openly, we will not be able to get a license to operate. And that would be meaning that we would end up in a much poorer world and we wouldn't be able to solve uh, the major problems that we face, shortage of foodstuffs, pollution, uh, climate change, uh, all the rest of it. I mean. We need technology for that purpose. Mm. So um, very clearly there are two strong themes emerging, one of communication, clear, um, purposeful communication and education of, of, the, of the general public and, and society at large. And, and very importantly to me that some of the, the final uh, points that you made, um, this has to be communication which is transparent and, and education which is transparent. Um, and so, in other words, respectful of the society uh, with which we communicate. The natural transition will be now to hand over to, to Brian to talk about maybe roles of universities in education in this context. How do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I see this problem as having two sides. There is uh, one side where people across society uh, are not trusting the information as presented. So vaccination, uh, GMOs, uh, climate change, in the old days, fluoridation of water are, are examples. Now, that is a uh, specific uh, issue of communication, and it's become much harder because the internet and the World Wide Web now allows us or allows people to go out and seek information on their own basis. We used to curate it, and the universities curated information, and we only told you what we thought was right, and there was occasionally questions around uh, in our own areas of what was right and wrong, but we curated the information. We are no longer able to curate the information for people, and that is a profound change to uh, how we perceive ourselves, and it has made it much, much harder. Uh, and so we need to figure out how to go out and communicate clearly uh, the ideas uh, that we see based in science. Uh, and how we do that? Well, 
education of people starting at age three all the way up. The more educated people are, the less likely they are uh, to rebel against this information. And these are, this uh, rejection of information, certainly right now, is linked to populism, and it's linked, and populism is linked directly to educational attainment. Not one-to-one, -one, but you can kind of see the, the strategy there. But it, you don't go out and start this at, to 50-year-olds. You need to start at age three, and you need to have a highly educated population. Uh, the other issue, which is quite different, is people not trusting uh, companies or the government with information in this new, what I will describe as a cyber, you know, uh, a cyber physical world where uh, artificial intelligence and data and robots are coming together in a new way. Uh, and that is not something based on education. It's not populist. It's well held across the population. And it's well held for reasons we've already discussed, is that there have been some, some problems that we have all see emerge. We have seen the manipulation of social media uh, by potentially state actors to influence public opinion. We've seen information being used in ways to manipulate our behavior by corporations to buy things in ways that we didn't completely realize. And so that has emerged because this is the Wild West. It is a place where there are no rules. There are no norms. And in the universities where we have created the entrepreneurs who have gone out and done this, we didn't sit down and describe to them what's the right way to think this through. Their company went from you know, a dollar to a billion dollars in, in 18 months, and they're just trying to make money, and they're not really thinking of this. So it, we sort of lost control of it. So one of the things that we're doing is we have started a new institute several years ago now, led by Genevieve Bell at Intel, where we are literally trying to create the design framework of this cyber physical world so that you get a set of rules like when you build a bridge or you do, for example, an electrical grid or how we're more recently used to computer science. There's the design principles to make these things robust. And this is an emerging uh, science that does not yet exist where we're literally going through and saying, you know, the fundamentals of what, you know, what agency does this system have? That is, what is it allowed to go out and do? What, what power does it have to go out and do things? How much autonomy do we give it? Uh, do we let it run completely open loop forever, or do we intervene and curate it, what, what its activities are? And finally, uh, you know, how, how much assurance do we have? Are we sure it's acting within the realm of the permissions we've given it? And those, that, that, that way of thinking things does not exist. It exists in all the other engineering disciplines. And we just take it for granted. But in this case, it's the Wild West. You know, I create a new app. It does something. It interacts with people in a complex way. And she'll be right. There are no engineering rules. So we're trying to create that engineering discipline. And you'll see now all sorts of human uh, interactive AI. That's, these are all the same flavor. And so you know, we're beginning to create that across the university system. And that's going to be part of our education, is helping create responsible tech in the future by designing mm. the systems that hopefully help stop some of the problems we've seen. Mm. The very interesting point is trying to, to develop rules into, in, in this sort of wild west of, of communication and, and indeed new disciplines as they, as they emerge. So we've heard a number of interesting discipline, uh, views from, di from different representatives. Um, it would be fascinating to hear your perspective, Carlos, from a, from a perspective of an institution. How can, how can institutions um, advance, uh, the, 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 well, solve, help, help solve, solve the issue which we're discussing? Thank you very much, and um, thank you to all for being here. Knowing that Chancellor Merkel is talking in the other room, uh, there's two conclusions, or you are really a group of friends of ours, or you don't know that she's speaking in the other room. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things I've done in these five years as Commissioner for Science was to think about this problem of communication. And I think uh, there's two things. One uh, is about the communication itself, about well, how we talk about science today, how do scientists talk about science, and then how we explain science. And I think that after the Second World War, 
we had a social contract somehow in between scientists uh, and the people that was about scientists telling people what to do, a little bit like Brian said, it was vertical, you could curate, um, you were actually, you would go to the, your doctor and your doctor would tell you what to do. And today that model is over. So we kind of need another social contract in between science and people. And I think that social contract has to be about communicating science through different narratives. Um, that's something that we do somehow very badly in Europe. Uh, we have this amazing program of 80 billion euros for science. And then I go home to my mother and I say, you know, we're putting one billion to map the brain. And my mother tells me, why? Why are you mapping the brain? Instead of telling my mother, uh, we have these one billion euros that will cure Alzheimer. And then she'll say, oh, okay, I understand. And I think that somehow the scientists, um, uh, they understand science in their own way. And I'm in the middle, I'm a politician, so I'm here in between the people and the scientists. And I think that what I can help as a politician is to build that narrative. And so we've started this project at the European Union level, which is about creating this mission-driven science. And that is exactly about taking five or six subjects at the European level that people will be proud in Europe to see that we will solve. So we could pick and say we're going to be the first to have the first electrical plane, the first commercial electrical plane. That would be such an amazing thing for the future. And then people will feel proud of it. And that being proud of it will make that people will vote for politicians that really care about science. And then you will have funding to do your science. But you have somehow to get out of your comfort zone as scientists, and some of you do this very well. And the ones that are here, I mean, Nobel Prizes, uh, you know, you do it very well. But most of the others, they don't get into this narrative. They talk about the story of science as what they love and not what people want to hear. And so we have to help on that. The second part is about the process of science. If I talk in a lot of town halls to people that are not scientists, young people, other people in small towns in Portugal, and um, people don't understand how science works, what is the process of science? And suddenly, uh, scientists somehow, uh, and uh, we uh, as politicians too, we want to have all the answers, and we don't explain to people. And so I think that is the first, or the first thing I did in the commission, was to try to have a group of uh, chief scientific advisors that will help us to explain the process of science. And by that I mean telling people what scientists don't know, telling people what science they have doubts, and then tell people, look, based on what we know, and in this process, which is a process of science, that's what we come to to explain you. But people don't want to know any more numbers or facts. They want to understand the process. If they don't understand the process, they will Google it. And it's worse, because then they get confused. And if it's about health, they get scared, because they think they're going to die. And so you have to explain the process. And, and so I think that these two things uh, would change this uh, social contract uh, that uh, as a lot of things that we're living. We're talking about multilateral organizations. We have to change the contract, how multilateral organizations work. And I think science is a little bit the same. So that's where we're heading at the level of the European Union. Thank you for this. A very interesting perspective. If you think about how we all communicate in different ways, so, so the landscape in which we operate has really changed, that you're talking about social contract, you can think of it as a, as a landscape in which we operate. And this, this notion that, that politicians can help scientists build a new narrative, and I loved the way you said it, that people can be proud of the science. I think that, that's the true, true level of engagement that we really ultimately want to strive for from, from, the, from the general society and the general population. I think that, that would be something amazing to strive for. I would like to open for questions from all of you. Uh, we've had some really fascinating um, comments here a lot talking about how the landscape has changed, how um, there are issues with communication and, and education issues, but first and foremost, opportunities for all of us. 
Yuli is dying to say something. Yeah. Will you be brief? <laughs> I, I will be very brief. Excellent. But when I look in this round and listen to this, this conversation, I feel like being at a funeral. And it's really all negative. We need to regulate. We need to avoid. We need to be careful. And that's all true. But very clearly, we got a mandate in front of us. We need to feed a growing population of the world. Mm -hmm. We need to get the standard of living up. We need to have clean oceans. We need to have cleaner air. And technology and science should contribute on that one. And I think whilst we need to talk about the very important hygiene factors of doing this in the right way, we should also focus on the impact that we want to create with the future of science and technology. If we use technology right, we can make the air cleaner. If we use technology right, we can get kids healthier. When we get technology right, we can make sure that the oceans of the world don't get polluted as much as they get polluted today. And I think that mandate, we also need to make sure we lift that in a positive way and don't feel like this is all negative because it's fantastic where we got to over the last couple of thousand years of mankind with science and technology. <coughs> I'm personally very excited where we can get in the future, but naturally, we need to manage the risks also in a good way, just as a side comment. Absolutely. I think there's a lot to be proud of, and so now <laughs> the challenge is to make everyone proud of it. Um, there are a number of questions already. If I can ask, if you can stand up when you ask your question and identify yourself, please. Hello, I'm Nicola Vandutarati. I'm a science writer from Zurich. I would be very interested to hear your opinion on that because I think it's not only the education. I think it's fascinating the fact that with vaccination, mm -hmm. it's the more educated mm -hmm. who are against vaccination. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a mismatch between education and knowledge. So do you have any explanation for that? Yeah, I mean, certainly vaccination in Australia is a middle class uh, problem. Uh, and it's not, but it is, again, it's moderate education, but the most educated people tend not to fall into it. So it again comes to not being able to curate information like we used to. And things can run amok. Uh, and they run amok by campaigns, by very serious people. And in the case of vaccination, we can trace it in Australia to a couple very high profile people who have get things started, it takes off on its own. So the question is how you deal with that. You could try to regulate it. I'm not sure that's a good idea. You can try to counter it, and we do. And I would say we're winning that war. But the reality is measles has popped up again after being almost completely eliminated, and it's painful. So I think that has to be, I, I think that ultimately comes to a failure of previous education, you know, three-year-olds to, to university. And to add on to that, it's just, it's the ability to discern what information mm -hmm. is valid and what information is credible that's been lost. And maybe that goes back to former education when we had a primary source of books. So things that have been peer reviewed, things that have been well gone through the process when now we have a wealth of information at our fingertips that can be very easily made to, to prove a point. You can change data points. You can change the way that a graph is shown and, and be able to explain, to, to have another perspective out of it. And it's the same data point that exists in invalid research. And it's that ability to discern what is valid information, what has actually gone through the right process, mm -hmm. the right scientific process to get, to get to the conclusions that is missing, that is something that is vital, again, to go back to education, that is vital to teach people at a very young age especially that we're coming to an age where self-learning and the, the process of education is starting to evolve. And by self-learning, everyone has everything at their fingertip. And it comes to a real danger on what information people learn when they're not able to discern what is correct, quote unquote, correct information or information that is collected in a correct manner versus otherwise. To my ears, as uh, an editor of a scientific journal, of course, what you say rings very true. Absolutely. There's a question here at the front. Hi. My name is Ferdinand Hambelopper. I'm the president of the University of Waterloo in Canada. Um, fantastic comments. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to limit my questions, but I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I use technology <laughs> uh, passionately. But at the same time, I'm concerned from a decision-making perspective, to 
not to be able to distinguish between pure curiosity-based science and mission-driven science. Mm -hmm. When we do this, are we, are we killing us at least part of our curiosity, which is absolutely at the cornerstone of every basic scientific discovery without linking it to a specific mission? Second quite quick note, I am extremely concerned about something called predatory journals. And this tumor is growing and we are absolutely on. This is the part that I really don't like the technology because it is creating a really fake artificial scientific world that many people are following. And this is, I, we don't have an answer, quite answer, but there is a very important role for the scientific journals to play to eliminate that. Thank you. Carlos. Can I just um, uh, answer for the, fir the first part, which is something that I've been thinking um, uh, for the last three years about the, the link in between. Uh, keep investing and investing more in fundamental curiosity-driven research. Absolutely. Especially because I think that being myself an engineer, I see that the new wave of innovation is a wave that will go back to fundamentals and to fundamental research in quantum technology or blockchain or other. And um, I think that missions can be very positive for it. Because if you look at the most successful example of a mission, which is uh, President Kennedy saying, I'll put a man on the moon, the results of putting a man on the moon had nothing to do with putting the man on the moon. There was so much curiosity-driven research that basically was, at the time, developed to cure disease, uh, to create new materials that were pure curiosity-driven. And I think that by creating at the top of the pyramid this mission-driven science, that can be four or five good examples, that is a way of carrying all the others. Because today, if you have, as a politician, to go around the country and talk about science, people want to know the results and the use of that science. And so you know that behind that, there's the fundamental science that sometimes, probably in 20 years, 100 years, will give results we don't know or never. But that's not the point. So I think that. I, as creating this mission-driven science idea for Europe, um, I think that I will be able to convince more people to invest exactly one, what you want. That's, for me, the example I get from a scientist in the CERN that once told me, look, the reason I do these things in physics, uh, it's something that nobody really understands, just me. But I have a story to tell that is not really the reason, but people like to hear. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and we have to, to create that. I think it's a, but it's a very good question. And I've been thinking a lot about it. Uh, and so I just wanted to tell you that there's a lot of reflection, but you, you also have a point. So we have to be balanced about it. And maybe just to compliment on that, um, for, for us as industrial leaders, I always say it's super important that you keep the playground for the future. And we had that situation in ABB. We spent about a billion five every year on research and development. And when I took over, it was I looked at it and we realized, OK, 70% is on maintaining and making better what we have. And a too small amount of it was really giving the people the opportunity in the sandbox to think about what we don't think about, what could be important for the future. But, so what did we do? We, we said, OK, there are certain spaces where we're going to allocate money. And one of the space was digital technologies. And I said, OK, guy, we, we, we got a team established. We said, team, you have 100 million. You have 100 million a year. And the others, the, the traditional guy said, we don't have that money. And I said, no, no, we have that money. You just spend it at the moment. So we cut your spending here. And we, you all together have to cut by 100 million. And we give the playground 100 million. And if we wouldn't have done that, to, I wouldn't have done that a couple of years ago, today, the company would really be in dire straits. Did we know what we're going to do with every dollar of this 100 million? Did we know whether we're going to spend exactly 100 million, 80 million, or we need more? No. But we just said we created the space. And I think that's something that's missing today in society very, very often, the ambition and, and, and the guts to say, OK, you know what? Despite my quarterly reports, my activists on the share register, everybody breathing down our neck, I take 100 million where I don't know what I get out of it next quarter, but I throw it at a future 
I believe there can be something created. And that's what we need to stand for. And we need to make sure the short-termism that is really impacting all of us every day, running companies, running budgets in research organization, doesn't kill the ambition for creativity, for spaces to be created to really shape the future. So very important point. So Brian and then Sarah, I think we want to. Uh, yeah, so I think one of the issues that we have uh, is missions are easy to sell, and I think they are an important part. But certainly over my career, uh, mission-oriented research, or what I would describe as translational research, where there is actually a purpose, and the work that you would do in your company will almost always be having some purpose, uh, it displaces the basic research. It just it has been happening, and you can see it in the statistics of all the, the countries. So uh, since we have the president of Waterloo, who has a Nobel Prize winner this year, Barbara Strickland, her work in laser physics, which was completely had no relevance to any, any mission anywhere, has now helped create the whole field of of, of, of quantum information, of manipulating quantum states, which is going to be a huge industry going forward. So we need to preserve it and make sure it doesn't get displaced, noting the importance of the missions. So, so the storyline that we just hear, heard right now, we don't hear. We don't communicate like this to the public. We don't go and tell them that this technology that you're using today actually was a result of investment in basic science research. And as a policymaker, we have this exact same dilemma on how do we ensure that we have a continuity of science in general by, by funding basic research versus garnering more and more support for funding research, and that's research with a purpose. And identifying the priorities, again, when we're talking about a country that's just starting science and technology, the first step that we had to do is corporations weren't looking into their future Absolutely. challenges. Mm -hmm. And they weren't in, they're, they're still not investing into future that, that, that they know that they will face challenges. And directional research, that's where it's being filled in. It's filled in into key sectors <coughs> that the UAE is currently in, into its oil and gas sector, into its ma manufacturing sector, into its logistics and travel and transport sectors. And then into our key priorities, better health, water, um, energy, and food. That is the directional uh, um, portion of it. When it comes to basic research, it's it's alleviating the <laughs> burden that is that is currently on the government to fund translational research, which is currently happening more and more. That is taking funding from basic research by building a case for this purpose for a new sector to harness to, to actually invest in translational research and applied research, and would enable. The, the flexibility for, the, for, the, for basic research and fundamental research to actually occur and happen. Mm. And then our dialogue needs to change. Um, I myself suffer from this. We're, we are not very good storytellers. Mm. We are very good at using jargons. And it it's, it's alienates people. Mm -hmm. And the more and more you talk to people in town halls, the more you realize that your language is not understood. And then one point of having those monumental challenges is what the UAE adopted about four years ago in, in taking on a large monumental uh, project of, of sending a spacecraft to Mars. And that has created quite a change in dialogue in children of all ages, where today um, we have cases in universities of student, students turning, changing their majors because of the mission from international studies, from economics. These are, these are important. But to the sciences, because when they first entered into these majors, they did not know that there was opportunities elsewhere. They did not understand the focus of it. So we should not go away from taking such monumental challenges that are risky, um, that sometimes make not a lot of sense. I mean, a country that is as young as the UAE, a country that um, has a space sector that was established less than 10 years ago when, when we announced that project and that has only been working on a very niche spacecraft development and still hasn't had their capabilities, is going into a challenge that has a 50% chance of success. So it's, we, we need to continuously remember that globally, that mind shift, that sort of Apollo mission halo projects, that moonshot, that still, that always needs to be there in, in the way that we do business and science. Mm -hmm. Final quick comment, Lars, on that topic. <clears throat> yes, it was, uh, it was back to one of the comments made initially by Brian, uh, which in the spirit of this Davos, uh, Brian, uh, where we see a, a move to bilateralism as opposed to multilateralism, 
uh, you were talking about systems design and through education um, defining uh, processes and designs for computer use for artificial intelligence. How do you see that being globally agreed upon in the world that we are facing right now? Because the use of it is global. So this means everybody has to get on on the standard. Uh, otherwise, it's meaningless to develop a standard. So, Well, I these things have developed very organically. So you can go through and look at computer science kind of emerged out of Carnegie Mellon and some other places. And people said, oh, gosh, OK. And then suddenly, the academic world is incredibly globalized. And you know, in 18 months, it'll be adopted everywhere. Look at CRISPR-Cas9. You know, Cas mm -hmm. Boom, something happened. 10 years ago, and it's in every lab in the world three or four years later. So it will happen very quickly when people get the right answer. Mm. Thank you. There's a question over there, please. If you stand up and introduce yeah. yourself, please. Hello, my name is Guta. I'm the um, president of a nonprofit cultural association based in Lisbon called Experimenta Design. And uh, I would like to listen to your opinion about the connection between science, technology, and culture. Essentially because, uh, well, I've been working the last 20 years with lots of artists that use science and, te and technology in a very important way, but I haven't seen the, the opposite. So it's rare to see people coming from science and from technology to look at the cultural field and to use it as a medium and as a possibility to expand um, in terms of communication, but also in terms of research. So you talk about education, which is, of course, fundamental, but culture is much more easy to spread. And it's a very important medium to reach people in a very um, efficient and um, productive way. So I've always mesmerized with this distance between these three disciplines, three areas. Thank you. Well, um, I don't know, have exactly an answer, but I have a, a story. In my company, my predecessor, had the belief that we, being largely technologists, uh, needed to be educated in culture. So he decorated the whole company with very avant-garde modern art. And uh, we thought it was horrible <laughs> uh, because we couldn't understand it. Uh, but it left an impression and, and it, on all of us uh, to ask questions. And, and it allowed uh, the, the employees of the company to, to stop and wonder about this piece of art. What was the real meaning of this? And this, this gave them, I think, the courage in their daily work uh, to ask questions which they otherwise would not have. So I do believe that there is a, a very clear link between our cultural orientation and our ability to perform science, but also to understand science and communicate science. Uh, I know it's a broad answer, but uh, I, I believe you, you're onto something. Let me give you one example that we did about a year ago to ad address the anxiety and the distrust in robotics. Um, we had, and, and in AI, because everybody is concerned about AI, everybody is concerned about robotics, and we thought, how can we transport a different message? And we did something quite unique. We got together with Andrea Puccelli, and in the opera of Pisa, we had our two-armed robot, Yumi, conducting <laughs> the orchestra, and Andrea Bocelli sang to it. And it was amazing. If we would have spent 500 million on advertising and on marketing money, we would by far not have mobilized the openness, the perception of the world away, if we wouldn't have done what we did. We had millions of YouTube clicks, if you go on it, go in, you, me, Bocelli, then you get it. And it's really fascinating. And it creates a completely different perception and climate towards technology when the conductor does an interview there with glowing eyes and says how wonderful it is to work with the robot. Out of the sudden, you're breaking down barriers that you would have never been able to break down with a scientific magazine, with advertising. I think that's, that's just one of the examples that I can share out of real life. Can I just say that, uh, and, and sometimes it's so mainstream you forget, think of astronomy. Astronomy is mainstream in cultural stuff everywhere. You see it in film, you see it in music, you see it in art, it's everywhere. It's on TV all the time because uh, astronomers have always felt the need to communicate what we do through any medium possible. So I think uh, that's a place in my own field 
where we have done it and done it quite effectively. So, so much it's actually mainstream. So it's interesting, if you consider the, the topic uh, that we were considering here for the last hour, the future of science and technology in society, very clearly, science and society is part of, science and technology is part of society. It needs to be better integrated. Uh, it obviously has always been part of society, but I think we have a challenge, all of us, to integrate it much better, to tap into the different aspects of society, including culture. Thank you for that question. I think that was very very important and, and importantly illustrated how powerful that can be. Um, we need to embrace better storytelling and, and talk, talk more fully and completely about science, how the fruits of scientific endeavor and technological developments actually very often, in fact almost always, have roots in the basic scientific exploration. And all of that can be wrapped up and folded into actually generating, ideally, a situation in which the whole society is proud of the scientific endeavor and technological development because they, they can all enjoy it. And so indeed, the, 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 the ultimate message, I think, is, is a very positive one. And of course, now the opportunity for us is, is to use these various tools um, and, and go into this society and engage this society on a continuous basis. I want to thank you very much, uh, all of you on, on the panel and all of you for being here and for great questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.